In our last video, we looked at the Chomsky hierarchy and the correspondence between the rules of human language and the different grammars in the hierarchy. We also saw that human language has context-sensitive rules. In this video, we're going to explore the consequences of having context-sensitive rules as part of our models of human language and what that means to us as programmers. Spoiler alert, it means that our, as our systems grow in number of words, in number of rules, processing power is going to shoot up, potentially even exponentially. So this is another presentation of the Chomsky hierarchy. Last time we looked at um, forms of grammars like regular grammars that can be described through finite state machines. One example of that was basic English sentences where you have um, one or more nouns for subject, verb, zero or more nouns for direct object. We also looked at context-free rules. For example, center embedding in English, where you have a sentence in English and you can embed another sentence, but you need to remember how many times you went into the recursion to then walk out of the recursion. But you don't need to look at the context. You don't need, not need to look at other sentences in order how to build your local sentence. Finally, we looked at context-sensitive rules, like Yoruba emphasis, where you have a string, and then you need to scan for the last appearance of a certain substring. You need to extract that substring, perform some transformations on it, and then use it as the output. This is a context-sensitive rule because you have to look at different uh, symbols, sounds, and you have to search in between them. So human language can be in different parts of the Chomsky hierarchy. Some rules uh, live in different parts of the hierarchy. This is also true of music, for example, and it's true of animal vocalization. For example, these are nightingale songs. And as you can see, they are repetitions of the same elements. And we can describe them with, for example, finite state machines. So in the green segments, for example, we have repetitions of three elements, beep, beep, beep. We have repetitions of more elements in the red segments, beep, 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 and so forth. Um, these are spectrograms, by the way, very similar to the ones we'll use for human language. And the regions with the darker colors are regions with more energy. So these, this is where the singing is located. As you can see, we could program a finite state machine to um, accept and to generate songs of nightingales, at least. So there are, so the, the Chomsky hierarchy is a way to describe phenomena that we see repeating in some way or that are rule-based in some way. Why do we care? Why are we even looking at this? Because the Chomsky hierarchy will make predictions about how long it takes to process a certain rule, how much time we're going to need to run the rule, and how much memory and space are we going to need in, uh, to process the rules. And it makes different predictions for different types of formal grammars. In general, the more um, complex the grammar is, the more expensive it will be computationally. So it will take longer to process in terms of time and will need more memory as well. Regular languages need less resources. Context-sensitive languages need many resources. So this says languages, by the way, but what it means is just series of strings, what we've been calling rules. Let's look at a finite, at a regular language model through a finite state machine. If you have one finite state machine, the, tra the transition between one state and the next is always going to take the same amount of time, regardless of how many elements you have in the finite state automaton. We, call, uh, we say that this processing time is constant. And we're going to use the notation O1 to call this a constant processing time. This notation, by the way, is called big O. It's a way of, this, of abstracting how long something will need to run. So O1 means that as you double the input, as you double the number of states in the finite state machine, you are going to need the same amount of time to go in between transitions. However, if you start adding up 
finite state machines, one finite state machine for the uh, roots of the verb, one finite state machine for the conjugation of a verb, one final state machine for the clitics of the verb. Each of them is going to take their own time to run. And we're going to need to start adding up those times. So the more finite state machines you have, the more time to process all of the uh, program will take. This time is going to grow in a linear fashion. If you, if you have two finite state machines, if you have, I'm sorry, if you have one finite state machine and then you double that and you have two finite state machines, this is going to take longer to process, twice as long. If you have three finite state machines, it's going to take three times as long. This type of growth is linear, where the growth in the input elements, in this case finite state machines, corresponds to a growth in the processing time. So two state, finite state machines, twice as long. Three finite state machines, thrice as long. What will happen with context-free rules? When you have a context-free rule, you have your finite state machine, but you need some other programming element to help you with recursion, for example. It could be making a variable that remembers how many times you go in. It could be having a stack uh, where you push and then you pop. Whatever you do, it's going to take time to perform those operations. A single one of these is going to take approximately O n. It's going to be linear so that um, you, as elements double, as you have uh, more stacks, you're going to need to run them twice as long, three times as long for three stacks, four times as long for four stacks, and so on. When you have this context-free rule interact with other context-free rules, so there's one here and then there's one inside of it, for example, this is going to multiply the times. This is similar to how in programming, when we have a four, like for i equals zero, run it so many times, and then another four inside of it for j equals zero so many times. This happens, for example, if we need to uh, look for duplicate elements on a list or if you, we need to traverse a list twice. So for every element in the first four, you need to traverse the element in the second four. Notice that this is going to multiply the time that it takes to perform this operation. The time is going to become polynomial because now it's whatever time you had before, multiplied by the same time, and maybe a third time if you have more nested force, and so forth. Polynomial growth is very fast. If, uh, if your data doubles, it means if you have, for example, O n to 2, or to, the, to the second power, it means that if your data doubles, your time will become four times as much. If you have O n to the third power, O n three. If your data doubles, you're gonna have eight times as much pro uh, time to process. So, as you can see, polynomial growth is faster than linear growth. And we also have context-sensitive rules. So, for example, in Yoruba, you need you have a string, and then you need the computer to find not only a certain substring, but to find the last occurrence of a certain substring. This type of search, uh, where you need to find permutations within a string, takes an exponential time to solve. It's uh, O to the two power N. If you have several, several of these coming together, if you have several context sensitive rules that need to interact, you're going to be looking at a growth that multiplies that. So it could be O to the 2 times however many symbols you have to look through and however many rules you have. This uh, processing method is at least going to be very costly and in the worst case scenario could grow exponentially. This is just an example for you to see how bad the times can get. In constant growth, so n equals 1, so like one finite state machine in just one, if you double the amount of input, the processing time will not change. For example, things will take 10 milliseconds. In a similar operation with linear time, so O n, 
if you double the amount of data that you have to go through, processing time will double. So something will now take three seconds, for example. In quadratic growth, in polynomial quadratic growth, if you have O n squared, you if and you double your data, the processing time quadruples, and now will take almost two minutes to process. The same algorithm, if it became cubic, so polynomial n to three, double the data, you have time that multiplies by eight. So now things could take 55 minutes more, for example. And in exponential time, things can grow to where they take hours or days. This problem is called combinatorial explosion, and it's always going to be lurking in the shadows. Whenever we handle human language, there's always the process that uh, processes are going to blow up in complexity, in processing time, and in storage needs. So whenever we add new words to our system or new rules to explain something, this is going to make it grow, but grow much worse than we thought it would. Think of a simple example, like an ELISA type chatbot where you have regular expressions, let's say nine regular expressions, to provide some simple interactions. It can say, hi, my name is whatever. Hey, how are you? Hi, I'd want to do this. Why do you want to do this? And let's say now you want to control for one more word. Now you would have to uh, edit all of the rules so that they can account for one more thing and then it, that's just adding one if you add if you want to add more words for example more verbs you're gonna have to maybe create more rules or maybe have you're gonna need more words that the rules are gonna have to go through also if you wanted the robot to i'm sorry the chatbot to become more complex you're gonna have to start adding rules for certain types of verbs rules for certain types of interactions rules for certain kinds of sentences to the point where before you realize it, you're gonna have thousands of rules. This thing is gonna go out of control. So modeling all of human language using rules can be a problem because of combinatorial explosion, because you need so many rules. And as a linguist, I can even tell you that we don't know how many rules you need to describe a language. We cannot even demonstrate to you that the number of rules is finite. So as a summary for um, our week's topics, we've been looking at computational abstractions, for example, finite state machines. And again, these are just abstractions for the kind of code that we regularly write. Simple abstractions cannot model human languages. So something simple like a finite state machine where you just say, uh, if I get an input, then I go here. If I get some input, then I go there. They are not enough because of recursivity you're always going to need to count things along the way um, because of center embedding because of long distance relationships you're going to always need to have some memory dedicated to these kinds of relationships and because of context sensitivity you're always going to be needing to go back and forth within the strings to figure out how to apply some of the rules even if we got rid of limitations like infinite recursivity, for example, the automaton we would need to describe human syntax and all of human language would be incredibly large, probably too large to be useful. And the process will take will grow exponentially as we are at more words and more elements. This doesn't mean that simple procedures are useless. There's many automata that are very useful. For example, phonology has simpler descriptions something like the structure of english syllables is relatively straightforward and so something like a hidden markov model can be used to explain sound and to have rules for sound input hidden markov models are very popular in speech recognition for example but in general it is very difficult to create models of language that are just based on rules this is why people try to use things like deep learning, for example, where rules are more opaque and it's more difficult to know what the computer is doing, but it helps us with some of the weaknesses of having to model every single rule. In summary, human languages can be described by rules, but making a computer program with explicit rules would make it too big and would make it run for too long.
next week, we're going to start studying languages as features. And we're going to slowly progress towards languages input for, for deep learning methods.